we're going to finish what we started. Uh, we we're talking about applying Gauss's law to certain situations. We're going to talk today about applying it to cylindrical symmetry, which we started. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, plane symmetry. And then we're going to apply this idea to, uh, we're going to apply Gauss's law to uh, an electrical charge that's uh, deposited on a conducting material. So we're going to talk about the electric field in a conductor and how to apply Gauss's law to figure out what the electric field is just off the surface of a conducting material. So let's get started. First, let's, let's review a little bit. Here's Gauss's law. We have uh, electric flux is equal to the closed surface integral of E dot PA, which is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Now, the purpose of Gauss's law, what we use Gauss's law to do is to find E. When we're applying Gauss's law, the whole purpose is to find the electric field uh, that's due to some kind of charge, you know, some kind of isolated charge. And you can only do it uh, by using this integral over here for certain highly symmetric situations. Now, last time we talked about spherical symmetry, and then we got started on cylindrical symmetry. Yes? Okay, epsilon naught is just a way, a, a, another way of restating the electric constant. Remember that um, K, which was 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Well, uh, another way of, of expressing this electric constant is that it is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So if you just take this right here and solve it for epsilon naught, then it's in there. Now, you could, you could use k in here, right? But it would be 1 over 4 pi k instead of uh, uh, over epsilon naught. Or no, it would be 4 pi k. Yeah, it would be 4 pi k times the charge enclosed. And you can do that and you can get the right answer and everything will work. It, it just, it turns out that, um, especially later on, it's more convenient to express the electric constant using this epsilon naught uh, rather than the electric constant. Okay, that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, okay. Please excuse the interruption. Oh dear. Teachers, please excuse students taking the Fresno City College or Willow International Placement Test. They are re to report to the library at 8.10. Okay. Students with the last name beginning with A through L. And for those of you to the listening to this test. online, Thank you. sorry, I don't edit my videos, so I'm not cutting that out. <laughs> All right. Um, so now, so the key to, to figuring out what the electric field is now, remember what electric fields are. I mean, electric fields me means that if, you're, if you have a little charge on you and you're at a location in space, you're going to feel a force. And that force is due to an electric field generated by some charge somewhere. And that's what this Q represents here. OK, so um, uh, and that's what we want to do. We're, we're, we've got some net charge somewhere. We want to figure out what the electric field is. So, I mean, that's our goal. All right, now, uh, what we did, uh, where we left off last time, was we had a, like a, 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 a line like this, like a wire or a cable of some kind, and we deposited a net charge on it. Now, remember, these charges are just sitting there. Everything we're doing right now is a situation where the charge is no longer moving. It's called electrostatics. So the this is not current in a wire. We're going to get to that later. Um, this is just static electricity. You know, if it's this positively charged, that means somebody stripped away some electrons, leaving a net positive charge. 
Now what you want to do is you want to choose a, uh, you know, these is, this is going to send field lines in all different, you know, directions like this, spreading out like this. But if you're looking at it in a cross section, like the wires coming out at you, uh, if, if this is the wires sticking into your eye right here, you would see the electric field like this. Okay, now you want to surround this with a cylinder. Okay, and the reason you surround it with a cylinder is that it makes this integral go away because E is the same coming out the surface area everywhere. It takes the dot product away because the electric field and the surface area vector are parallel. And you know, here's a little here's a little surface area right here, and it's sticking out that way, the same direction as the electric field is coming out of it. So basically it turns E dot DA into just E times A. So E times A times the quantity enclosed over epsilon naught. And then what we did last time is we said, okay, look, the area that has electric flux coming through it is just the, you know, this part right here. The end caps right here, this has no flux penetrating through it, so we don't need to include it. And so uh, what is the area of this? Well, it's the circumference times the length. So it's 2 pi r times the length. How much charge is enclosed in here? Well, it depends on the charge per unit length times the length. Charge per unit length we call lambda. That's the char linear charge density times the length over epsilon naught. And now we can solve for E. So E is equal to, uh, let's see, what is it? Lambda, put all the constant stuff, 2 pi epsilon naught times 1 over R. So this constant stuff times 1 over R. So this, this diminishes by, uh, is inversely proportional to the how far away we are from the wire. Okay. Now, um, let's apply, uh, let's have another um, kind of um, cylinder here. here. Here, you see here the charge, see the charge is on, along a straight line. But what if I actually had a cylinder filled with charge? Let's take a look at another example. Here's an actual cylinder. Now let's just say this goes on forever. We have to we assume it goes on forever because that way we can ignore any electric flux that isn't coming straight out from the uh, central axis here. Now we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to deposit charge uniformly throughout the volume of this cylinder. So this is a charged, non-conducting uh, cylinder with charge uniformly distributed throughout its volume. Now, I think you can see that if I choose... Now, what I want to know is what is the electric field so this is what's given. Am I on camera? Yeah. Um, if this is what's given, and let's say this has a radius of big R, uh, what I'm trying to find is, well, what's the electric field when our, our distance R is greater than R? And what is our electric field when R is less than R? In other words, when I'm inside the cylinder. Well, if I choose a Gaussian surface, let's solve this. I'm going to choose a Gaussian surface that's on the outside here. So here's my R. And um, you can see that uh, I'm going to get a result that's just like the one I got before. All the charge is in there, so I get E dot dA equals the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Now E times A, A is 2 pi R times L. Remember, this represents the area of my Gaussian surface. 
And so here, my Gaussian surface is on the outside here. Now, the challenge is to figure out how much charge is enclosed. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to say that the charge density inside there is rho. And rho, the Greek letter rho, is what we use to represent volume charge density. So, all we need to do to figure out the charge enclosed is to multiply rho times the volume that has charge in it. And this is where students make mistakes, is that they figure out, okay, you know, what, what am I finding the volume of? Here I'm finding the volume of all the stuff that has charge in it, because I want the amount of charge. So it's from here to, from here over to here. Well, what, what's the volume of a cylinder? It's the area times the length, right? And so this is going to be the area of this is pi big R squared, right? Not the radius of my Gaussian surface, because there's no charge over here. There is charge in there. I mean, charge stops when you get you know, from 0 to R. Then you get past that. There's no more charge. So you don't want to add more charge than there is. So it's pi r squared times L, right? That's the volume of the cylinder, right? The area times the length. So you have to know a little, remember a little geometry here. Over epsilon naught. And um, now the length cancels. And so I get E, E out here is going to be equal to, oh, the pi cancels as well, doesn't it? So let's put all the constant stuff. Rho r squared over 2 epsilon naught. Okay. And then we have times 1 over r. So this is the result. This is, you know, if, if I give you rho and I give you r, and this is a constant of nature. So it's 1 over r, just like, just like it was over here, right? I mean, when we looked at this problem, we had some constant stuff. It's a little different. This is a linear charge density. This is a, um, a volume charge density, so you have to multiply it by r squared. But um, dimensionally, it's the same. And, um, and oh wait, or is it? Let's see. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we're good. Now what about inside. What about inside the cylinder? So what if I took my uh, Gaussian surface and I, I'm, I actually put it inside here. So now my R uh, for, of my Gaussian surface here, my position, is actually inside the charged cylinder. And I want to know what is the electric field on the inside? Well, I can use Gauss's law to do that. I mean, try using Coulomb's law. You'll drive yourself insane. But if you use uh, Coulomb's law, I mean uh, Gauss's law, it's pretty easy. So you just say, all right, E dot dA equals um, the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Now, this, this left side isn't going to be any different because it's still, you know, the electric field times um, uh, 2 pi r. Whoops. Uh, times L, where L is the, the length here of my, there's L. Um, but the trick is, and it's all, this is always true, the trick is figuring out how much charge is enclosed. Well, the trick, I mean, the first trick is figuring out what area I'm enclosing the charge with. And the other one is figuring out how much charge is enclosed. And if you get those two things right, you're going to get the right answer. Now, how much charge is enclosed inside here? Well, certainly not all of it. There's all this charge on the outside that you're not going to include. Well, I'm, to figure out how much charge is enclosed, I, I go rho times the volume that has charge in it. Well, the volume that has charge in it here is, the, is actually the volume of the Gaussian, uh, surrounded by the Gaussian surface. Do you see that? Here's my Gaussian surface inside, so it's only the charge that's inside here that, um, 
that contributes to the electric field out there. So the charge enclosed is um, pi little r squared. See, over here it was pi big r squared. But over here it's pi little r squared. OK, times the length. And then, um, and that's the charge enclosed. And then, of course, you have to divide by epsilon naught. And now this is a little different here, right? This cancels this. Now the uh, pi cancels the pi. But look, this is little r, but this is also little r. When you were outside the cylinder, it was big R, but which is a constant, right? But this, this varies depending on where you are. So that cancels that. So I just need to divide by 2 to solve for E. E is equal to rho. Oh, OK. It's equal to rho times uh, 2 epsilon naught times r. Now notice I, I like to put the constant stuff in parentheses. And, and this is uh, um, a little bit very similar to what we got with um, sphere or the sphere. The electric field is a function of r. And r is my distance away from the central axis. So when I'm on the central axis, think about this. I mean, this is this is kind of a, a common sense, sort of, if you can apply common sense to electromagnetism. If you think like a positive charge, here's my little Q-naught. I'm a little Q-naught. All right. And here's my Q-naught. And look, for every charge above it, there's another charge below it. For every charge in front of it, there's a charge behind it due to the symmetry of the situation. And therefore, there's no electric field in there. So when R is 0, the electric field is 0. Um, and then as I move farther out, there's more charge you know, below it than above it until we get to the very surface right here. Now, what happens when little r is equal to big R? Do we get the same answer here and here? We sure do. When little r is equal to big R, this will cancel this. And when little r is equal to big R, it just be, they become the same thing, which is what you want. So that's uh, so. Here's my answer when I'm inside. Here's my answer when I'm outside the charged cylinder. And that's how you use Gauss's law to derive it. Okay, let's talk about a charged plane now. And when we're dealing with um, cylindrical and plane, you know, planar symmetries. We have to pretend like something is true that's impossibly true. That is, like the, the cylinder is infinitely long, and now we're going to pretend like the plane is infinitely wide. Why? Because we, we're trying to avoid end effects here. So let's, let's talk about plane symmetry. Okay, suppose I have a plane with charge on it. So here's a plane, and it goes in all directions. So this just represents the fact that this plane is infinitely, uh, infinite in extent anyway. And let's put some positive charge on it, which means I have an infinite amount of positive charge, which means there's an infinite uh, number of protons in the universe, which isn't true. <laughs> but Sometimes, you know, physics is a fantasy after all. Now, if you think about this, let's use common sense here. Put a little positive charge right here. What direction is it going to get pushed? Straight up. Now, as I move farther away, well, first of all, think about this in terms of field lines. You know, let's say this one sends a field line down, this one sends a field line up. Okay, this one sends a field line up. This one sends a field line down. Okay, they, they kind of have to split up the, uh, the duty here. Oops, I don't know. I'm kind of messing this up, but it's good enough. Something like that. All right, notice that be because this thing is infinite, the field lines are all parallel to each other. They're not spreading out, are they? So what are we going to... What's going to be true about the electric field? 
Yeah, it's going to be a constant. It's not going to depend on how far away I am from that plane. And Gauss's law is going to show us that. But it's always good to kind of look at the physical situation and see the physics and you know, use your imagination and see the physics before we crank out the math. The math will give us the result, but it's kind of nice when we, we also understand the result before we apply the math. All right, so now, well, what kind of shape am I going to uh, put in there? Well, it doesn't matter what area. I can use a sphere or a, or a rectangle or a square. I'll use a, a circle. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to contain this. Here's my Gaussian surface. And like I said, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a um, cylinder. No. You could use an amoeba. It's just that it's hard to draw it the same on the bottom and then so yeah, don't do that. No, it doesn't matter what shape you use. Um, now notice something here that this Gaussian surface, a Gaussian surface is always a closed surface, so it contains a volume, right? And here's where the charge is on this area right here. So let's say that this has a surface area density. We call that sigma. That's the amount of charge per unit area. Now, um, let's now apply Gauss's law to it. E dot dA equals the amount of charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Remember, this area here represents the area of the Gaussian surface that has electric flux penetrating through it. So let's look at this Gaussian surface. Let's call this A, just arbitrarily. A is the area that has charge on it inside. Now, let's take a look at this Gaussian surface. It has a surface area around the outside, you know, this curved cylinder-like thing. But is there any electric flux moving through that surface? No. So we don't need to include it. The only part of the, this Gaussian surface that has electric flux moving through it is the top and the bottom. So, um, and it's uniform everywhere and perpendicular, so I get rid of the integral and the dot product, and I just call this E. Now, here's the trick. What is the area if this is A down here, this is the area that has charge on it that's enclosed by the surface. How much area is on our Gaussian surface that has lines of electric flux moving through it? Yeah, it's two A. It's the bottom surface and the top surface. So that's A plus A. So we have A, A, triple A. All right, so, but this is the area that has charge on it. This is the top of our Gaussian surface. This is the bottom of our Gaussian surface. And there's two of them. And they're identical. So it's 2A. Now, how much charge is enclosed by my Gaussian surface? Sigma times A. OK. And now the area cancels out. And so the electric field out here or down here, and it doesn't matter how high you are off the plane. As long as you're off the plane, if you're on the plane, the electric field is zero, I think. Yeah. But if you're off the plane at all, it's going to be equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. And that's the electric field for a plane. OK. new subject now. We're going to talk about um, conducting materials. And then we're going to apply this plane symmetry to a conducting material. So conducting
materials. I don't know, maybe I should make this a separate video, but... In fact, I am. I'm going to stop this for just a second.